Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ben. Um, we recently joined the Eclipse Foundation as Kinetics. Um, and uh, um, I guess that being part of the IoT workgroup would be um, a very big opportunity for participating actively on the development of some of the platform that are we, use, we are using um, inside the company. It's like we will see in this presentation. And we are using actually actively with our customers. Um, I've been talking about Eclipse Hawkbeat quite a while last year. I was at the Eclipse, Conven uh, the Eclipse Con in Germany and uh, Java One and Linaro Connect. And most of my talk was about the OTA, so the uh, how to update systems uh, on the air using Hawkbeat. Uh, but what we actually did in the past month is actually take a Hawkbeat and process it and make a very important part of our delivery platform pipeline inside the company. So the agenda is um, pretty straightforward. It would be like quite technical, but I would be skipping some details. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about us and uh, what the motivations are uh, between, uh, behind our work on the delivery pipeline for uh, Android and embedded Linux devices. Uh, then we'll be talking, obviously, about Hawkbit. And uh, we will then talking about Update Factory, that is our delivery platform that has been powered by Eclipse Hawkbit. So it's a real um, case of study about how Eclipse Hawkbit changed our delivery pipeline. Um, then we will be talking about our open source contribution. Um, so we will be talking about the Android way to managing operating system updates. It's pretty clever and clean. Uh, it's not the only way you can update an operating system. Um, it's just our way to interpret how an operating system should be, um, uh, should be updated. There are other flavors out there how to update an image of a running embedded device. Uh, then we will be talking about the Update Factory Android client that we developed and published under the open, uh, sorry, the Eclipse Foundation 1.0 license. Um, and then we will be talking also the embedded Linux client that is uh, leveraging another open source project called S, uh, SW Update, developed by Stefano Babic from Denks, the U-Boot guys, just for understanding you know, who they are. So who are we? Uh, Kinetics is, um, provides like full software stacks for the most popular embedded processors, especially the NXP uh, application processors. Uh, we work actively on Android systems. So what we do is to tailor Android embedded operating system for different kinds of devices. And uh, uh, more important is we embrace embedded development following the best practices to create a repeatable, reliable process for releasing software. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys come from the uh, enterprise development, but today, if you are doing delivery of a whatever project you're working on, you do continuous integration, you do continuous delivery, and continuous building. Those kind of concepts has not be, has not they have not been really popular on the embedded world where I guess many things change in the past 10 years, but still there is a lot of resistance between um, who wants to actually apply those guidelines and who actually don't, doesn't care. Uh, and we have many customers that actually don't know exactly how to make their process reliable and repeatable all the time instead of tweaking sometimes before production how they should deploy their um, OS on, on their devices. So um, we had to figure it out how to take the OS delivery um, for us, our customers, during our development to, the, to a different level. And uh, uh, the primary reason we wanted to announce our delivery uh, process obviously for supporting customers in stage and production, but also to enhance our 
development lifecycle by building and delivering OS images upon specific code commits. Um, some time, right, when you talk about embedded operating systems, um, you think about a bunch of, of configuration files upon different services that you want to assemble in your like very tailored OS. But working in Android, where the definition of operating system is a little bit different from a Unix-like operating systems, where the way things are built are really kind of application way, not really like a demons and configuration files. So when you want to extend something, you've got to go into the Java code or the C++ code. So what you do is to actually do a commit and launch a new build to see if what you're doing actually takes place. Uh, then obviously we want to track updates and divide them for the device type and use cases. Obviously this is you know, pretty much what everyone uh, does on the uh, update space. And, more, and very important, uh, we care about devi device metadata. Um, what are metadata? Metadata, uh, metadata are like every kind of feedback that you want to send to the device or you want to receive to the device. For example, we may want to know which OS version we are running on the, on the device. We may want to know what is the local IP on the local area network. But most of it, we would like to have some pullback from the device. Let's say that we, I have a testing suite. I'm deploying an operating system. I have a series of tests that I want to run before actually activate my device. And I want to send them back in order to see what is the um, sanity status of a sort of device. So I have to close the loop between what I'm sending and what I'm receiving back from the device. So probably many of you are familiar with you know, is a, a building and delivery pipeline. And uh, uh, again, one, one of our efforts is, can we apply this to embedded development? Can we apply the same thing we are doing when we develop a sort of like a GEE, -E, a JEE -E enterprise application, can we, can we take some of it and um, apply to, uh, to what we do with operating systems? Well, the, the, the answer is not everything, but best practices can be used. For example, in, in this picture, we see like a developer working on some code. We have a Git repository, and then we have a building engine and uh, the building engine is uh, connected to a continuous, integra continuous integration front end like could be uh, Jenkins, right? And then the building engine is building the OS. Uh, and then when the OS is built, uh, we have a report on the CI front end and that says the uh, OS has been built successfully or has been, the build is broken. And then if the build is exact, uh, was successful, we can deliver the OS images to a delivery platform and then on the target devices. And we may want to have a feedback back from the target devices that uh, some local test has been passed successfully. And then close the loop between the target devices and the delivery platform that actually sends back to the CI front end those information and we can visually understand if actually everything is on the right place. So uh, we fit the delivery pipeline uh, with Eclipse Ockbit. Probably many of you know about Eclipse Ockbit, but probably others not. Uh, the definition is down there. Uh, create a domain independent backend solution for rolling out software updates to constrain edge devices connected to an IP based networking infrastructure. So this is probably what any other uh, OTA um, uh, update system is. Uh, you probably are familiar with Mendel or uh, there are other platform out there, right? So. Um, we will see why actually we choose Hawkbit. So uh, Hawkbit in a, in a nutshell is like uh, pretty straightforward. I, I just like show you directly from here, right? So um, st there are really few steps. What we do is to upload an image that can be an OS image, can be an, an application, right? And that we create what is a software module. So we can see here that uh, 
these OS, up, these OS update software module just have um, an, an, an OS image here. Um, here I have um, an Android app that is made by two APKs, right? So I define a software module by uploading two artifacts on it. And what I could do, obviously, is to create a new software module. Software module can be an application only, an OS only, and I create actually custom tags like this. I can specify the vendor, the version, right? And then create what, what is a software module. After that, what I can do is to create a distribution. So a distribution is just a collection of software modules. So for example, here I have this OS distribution. The OS distribution contains this software module. And if you remember, this software module contains a particular artifact. Uh, here uh, I have an Android app that is like a demo app. And obviously, I can uh, create uh, a software module like uh, Update Factory. Android client, uh, the version is the, let's say, the 0.1.1. So in here, uh, I just drag and drop what is the software module that belongs to this distribution. And at the end, what I want to do is to deploy my software distribution to a device. So here we see one device. Actually, this device is polling. So what I can do is, for example, also drop the device here, right, and delete it. What I will expect is actually the, that device to show up again on my uh, uh, dashboard. The, I think the polling time is 30 seconds. And uh, what I will do is to literally uh, drag and drop my software distribution on the target device, and the game is uh, pretty much done. Let's see if it shows up. Yes, so here I have a notification, I have a target device registered, and then I have the device here. So I can drag and drop the software distribution and save a sign and um, it just sent it to the to the remote device. So um, we prepare the update file, upload it, we create a software module, and we put an artifact on it. We create a distribution, and uh, we can do a little bit more. We can manage our rollout um, by groups, for example, or uh, it's very it's a nice feature. So we can. Um, uh, group threshold for partial rollouts. If I don't want to roll out 100% of my devices, I can roll out to 20% and just see what the result is. If something goes bad, it goes bad just for a small percentage of my um, production production set. Uh, again, I can create target metadata like uh, ran like just like what I need. Uh, for example, um, hardware revision other custom metadata, OS revisions, uh, iLocal IP. Uh, and actually, I can send back literally logs from the device to be processed by the um, uh, continuous integration system and eventually raise an alarm that something didn't work properly. So uh, why we choose Hawkbit? That actually is pretty interesting. Uh, Hawkbit is a platform, is a fr is, yeah, I would say a platform that is um, very straightforward. Um, it contains a user interface that we saw uh, already uh, ready to be used. So we have a, a, a working UI, and we have also the entire um, ecosystem of API that allow you to write your own UI. Uh, on the device side, we have uh, the DDI API, uh, device direct uh, interface. There's, those are uh, REST API that actually allows you to write your client for whatever embedded device. And um, again, the architecture probably can be familiar for some of you. Uh, for us, it was a really good feedback to have uh, the entire framework being built around Spring. 
Um, so Spring is a very well established technology for web applications. And the architectures were something that we were already familiar with. Uh, some, some information about these diagrams uh, may be useful. So um, MongoDB uh, that we actually changed. So we were following what they were saying, right? <laughs> so um, is the artifact repository. Uh, we changed, uh, we are using S3 from Amazon. Um, so we have MariaDB that we actually, um, uh, we are using RDS from Amazon as a, a metadata repository. Um, Redis, uh, we will be talking about Redis uh, in the next slide, but actually Ockbit is ready for high availability. So if you want a caching mechanism over your nodes, Redis may be the right place to have those caching information stored. And obviously, we have also the MQ, uh, sorry, the RabbitMQ and MQP protocol for uh, what is called the Device uh, Management Federation API. We are not using that. It's another way to communicate to end devices using the MQTT uh, protocol. Uh, again, Hawkbit is really uh, is really easy to create a cluster. Uh, uh, so we, we did it actually. We use a, we use a Docker Swarm and Docker Cloud that actually now is uh, not supported anymore. But we, we are switching to Kubernetes. Um, so uh, it's really easy to uh, create uh, um, uh, multiple nodes for high availability. Uh, RabbitMQ is um, um, handling the message queues and uh, you know like spreading all the um, information around your cluster. Uh, there is still one a point of failure here that is part of the uh, is part of the architecture that is actually the uh, the uh, metadata DB but it's not really a point of failure because the uh, device metadata they are not so many and not so heavy so if you're using uh, something like RDS is pretty much like a high availability solution anyway so it's not really a, a point of failure. <clears throat> so uh, we liked Hawkbit, and we decided to build our own delivery uh, platform uh, based on, on, on it. And we create what we call Update Factory. So Update Factory is our uh, OS image and application delivery platform powered by Eclipse Hawkbit. Um, we use Update Factory for two things. Uh, doing development, we are using as a delivery pipeline. Every time we're building a new revision of the OS, and we want to send it to customers for day evaluation. And then we use, obviously, uh, Update Factory for rolling out uh, production software using the rollout campaigns. Uh, the architecture we built uh, on, on, uh, on, Hawk, on Hawkbeat Update Factory is, is shown there. But basically, what we did um, is to put together different pieces so obviously we have a client service on the embedded device. Uh, then we have, we have an, an update server that is actually featuring Eclipse Hawkbait, that is the core of the update uh, mechanism. We built our custom uh, identity and authorization uh, management server. And uh, we moved the artifact repository on S3, the metadata repository on RDS. And so we built a sort of high availability service creating a cluster of EM and update servers using Docker Swarm. And then obviously, we are relying on RDS and S3 for the um, metadata and uh, artifact part. Uh, so the, the problem we have to face is we need clients for Hawkbit to be installed into the embedded device. So um, Clients implement the server state machine and update workflow. So there are a lot of documentation. Uh, by the way, um, uh, we create documentation on the update factory. So we, we create a, uh, an update factory IO uh, repository for documentation. So here you can actually find um, everything uh, from a UI perspective, how to handle things, and also how to write your own configuration file for different operating systems. Uh, 
uh, using the framework that I'm showing you right now. So um, first of all, an implementation of the DDI API on Linux is, is provided by software update, Suricata daemon. So Suricata is a daemon that runs inside software update that is an open source project on JPL2. And this is actually pretty ready. We fixed some, something here and there, but uh, it was actually working off the shelf pretty much. And then what we did is to, uh, uh, it's not actually a complete implementation, Suricata. So it's lacking some, some, some API. Uh, what we did is actually to build a complete implementation of the DDI specification. And we provided um, as an Android client and publish under the Eclipse uh, license. Uh, okay, I don't know how many of you work with embedded systems, but basically we have two ways for managing software updates. The first one is called the double copy. Um, device that features the double copy, they have to carry two images of the operating system inside the device. So each copy must contain the kernel, the root file system, and whatever other component that is crucial for the system to run. Um, cooperation with the bootloader is actually very important to understand which copy should be booted um, at the boot time. Single copy instead um, is an in, rely on an independent bootable system that is required to manage the update. Uh, it's possible to update kernel. Uh, because this independent system is segregated by the regular OS. And uh, there is still a collaboration with the bootloader because we have to decide if you want to boot the independent system called also the recovery system or the regular operating system. Boot copy is pretty much um, shown in this diagram. So the bootloader switch between uh, different kind of partition schemas, right? Because if you think about if you have a your own operating system, you probably have multiple partitions. But the two things are completely replicated. What are the pro and cons? Well, um, you have a completely fallback in, in case of failure, right? Because you have a working copy. And it's pretty easy, easy to implement. But it comes from, with a price that is the storage actually you need to, 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 to maintain two copies of the operating system that can, can be quite heavy, especially if you're working with EMMCs that are still quite expensive if you are um, relying on more than 60 gigabytes of space. Uh, single copy is more clean as a design. We have the bootloader that actually switch between the, the, uh, like the regular OS or the uh, independent system called also recovery system. So this will be actually address as a recovery system. And the recovery system uh, can eventually act on the boot partition or in the root file system partition. If I'm updating a system, here there will be an independent system that may want to write here to update the kernel, for example, or here to update the root file system. Uh, pro and cons, well, the pro, the uh, the, the disk space is actually uh, very, uh, you can save a lot of space. And uh, uh, the entire update mode lives in RAM. So it's small and fast, and it requires much less space than the double copy. The cons is you don't have a fallback. If some, someone unplugs the power while you are writing, the thing that you can do is to just reboot the device that will enter again in recovery mode and try it again forever until it is successful. So why I'm talking about approach the Android way? Because we literally liked the way Android was managing update. And so we were thinking about, hey, why don't we do that same process on Linux as well? So Android use a single copy approach. And uh, um, the approach splits the upgrade in two phases. The preparation, where um, you collect all you need from the regular OS. And then you do the execution, where you go in recovery mode, right? And um, the system will write what it has to write. 
and the system will be rebooted with the new OS. At, at the end, you may want to update the update system as well, but when you have a, a full running OS at the end. Um, I may have like, uh, if someone is familiar, probably I want to show you this. So let me see. So, you, you install your uh, software, right, uh, using the uh, Google Play. But let's say that you want to upgrade the entire operating system with your custom platform, so you're not using Google Play. So we are using here Hotbit uh, Update Factory, and what we are doing is just drag and drop our software distribution to the target device. Here you can see the window with the target device, and um, what we want to do is to just write a new image with uh, just one app more. So it's really simple update, but we update the entire system. So we are using a client that we uh, developed just to have a visual representation of what's going on. So we have a new available update. We accept it, we download it. So the system is asking you um, authorization and the system is ready to be updated. So now Android will boot in recovery mode Again, we are using uh, Android as a single update, uh, sorry, a single image update system. So you probably are familiar with the, um, these um, uh, character that is uh, showing the system is, uh, is, 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 is being up updated, is updating and be updated at the end. And uh, the system reboots with a new fresh image, right? Where now we have, um, you know, a new application installed. So um, how Android works is pretty straightforward. Um, your, your phone usually uh, registers on a manufacturing cloud, so like Samsung or whatever is your manufacturer or provider. Um, uh, pulls for available updates, notify uh, updates, uh, uh, notify if update is, an avail is available and if you want to download it. Uh, notify update is uh, when the update is ready to be installed and reboot to the recovery OS like we saw in the video before. Um, so this is a little bit of inside how does it work. So the uh, recovery system has a particular um, update binary that um, take a script and execute that script that is in a, a domain specific language uh, and copy uh, upon the script all the resources in the, uh, in the EMMC directly on the storage and then reboot to the uh, regular OS. So this is the workflow. We have the bootloader. We have a recovery partition. In the recovery partition, I have my recovery bin that is it's called recovery, <laughs> the, the, binary, uh, the binary file. And this recovery bin uh, launch the update bin that interpret a script, flash whatever he has to flash in the um, uh, regular OS partition and reboot the device. So what are the advantages of this way? It's a single copy. Uh, the OTA actually runs in regular OS space. So we have full access to all the Android API. If I have to understand if I have enough battery, I can ask the system if I have enough battery to do the to perform the update. Uh, all the artifacts are prefetched, so if I don't have connection, one I have, you know, the downloaded already the artifacts, I can be offline. And um, recovery environment is on RAM and read only, so it's very isolated and and solid and secure. So this is how actually uh, the Android client we implemented um, using the Ockbit API. So we develop uh, a service and then we develop also a UI app. So if you want to see what's going on, you can also, but it's not, it's not mandatory. So you can just run the service. Um, we specified some um, parameters like the tenant. That, that's Ockbit language. The tenant is the, um, customer, let's say the, the customer resources. So tenant can be ACME. Uh, the ID is the what um, Hawkbit called the controller ID is the device name. And then obviously the URL of the uh, platform from where I have to gather all my um, artifacts, the, my OS images. Um, so everything is managed by those clients. 
uh, clients uh, download from Update Factory, store in what is called a task partition, and then uh, when I, um, I, I'm notified that I'm ready to install an update, uh, update can be forced. That means the device doesn't ask me anything, or it can be uh, soft. The device asks me, hey, do you want to uh, now uh, um, reboot your device and, and update the OS? And once I'm doing that, the recovery system starts with his own kernel and his own uh, URAM disk. And I am ready to write the new system on whatever partition. So here is where the system user space live, and here is where the kernel device tree and the Android URAM disk uh, lives. So these are a little bit of um, resources. So on GitHub, we have our um, the open source implementation of the uh, Update Factory Android client. Uh, we also develop a Java independent library. So if you have a Java, or you want to deploy, uh, sorry, develop your own Java um, client for Hawkbit, you can actually take this, and this is a full Java implementation of the DDI API. Uh, some documentation here, and uh, we are also we have also a technical blog where we are publishing a lot of use cases that we are uh, sharing with the community just for um, um, announce the knowledge of what you can do with this platform. So, um, why we cannot replicate the same smoothness of Android in a Linux-based embedded system? So. Um, we want to replicate the Android-like OTA mechanism on an open embedded Yocto uh, or uh, build root or whatever distribution you're using. So uh, the, the basics of this implementation is we want a device to cloud communication. So we have Ockbit on the back. We have a bootloader coordination. We have a recovery partition. We have a recovery um, boot script. That's just a detail. You can skip it. And we have a recovery RAM disk. And uh, obviously, we want to give the cloud the feedback of the installation process. So we, um, uh, as, a, as a, a starting point for everything, we are using this uh, SW update um, open source project. It's written in C um, by Stefano Babic. And by the way, it's what is interesting here, um, he implements a very Android similar update file description um, in order to perform command like uh, pre-installation commands, post-installation command, and is based on a CPIO format, so really Unix-like um, uh, basic uh, file format. And yeah, how much time do we have? Oh no, okay, so let me go here. So we replicate the same things on Linux, and I wanna show you something. Uh, so let's go here. Right. So this is Linux. So still we have the uh, device here, so we, I'm logging into the device. I'm just showing that I'm lacking some um, resources on the system, and so I will be uh, upgrading my OS from the version 1.0 to the version 1.1. So I'm doing the same stuff I, I've been doing with the Android case. So this is the demo, right? This is the sort of DDI client running on Linux. Thanks to software update, uh, you just drag and drop again. So this is Hawkbit. You drag and drop your um, image on the target. You save and assign. Uh, the embedded device will uh, find out that there are an update um, when it pulls back the device. And let's see what happens. So uh, it's getting all the information. So this is using actually the DDI API. Software updates probably the implement 60% of those. Uh, we add some kind of um, new features in order to uh, support this mechanism based on recovery. So now the system is booting in recovery mode. And uh, these are the scripts that are used by um, the recovery mode, copying file and doing whatever is needed to copy the new uh, image. It's actually, the image is written like 
DD, DD way, so you're DDing uh, bit per bit, uh, writing the new image on the EMMC, you reboot the system, and uh, uh, you will have your um, new fresh OS running on, on Linux. Can we please move to questions, Nicola? Yeah, let me finish with this. Conclusions. So, well, no, Nicola, I'm next sorry. Next possible. We, yeah, right. no, you, okay. you, uh, we are really over time. Uh, what I suggest is we take uh, maybe one uh, um, one question while the, while the next speaker is set up. Uh, I think you, okay. you sent a few interesting links that people can um, uh, can use to find out more. Um, is there a question for Nicola? Yep. For some reason, actually, is like power off. Oh. Hi. Everything uh, power off. Thank you for the Sorry. presentation. And Hi. so, how to use this Hawkbit infrastructure on a uh, real time operating system? Because we we do OT updates on a uh, real time operating system. So, so it's like micro microcontroller? Yeah, it's a, it's a microcontroller. Okay. So, we use TI Autos. So, how compatible is it to work with this Hawkbit? So the first demo that Bosch developed for Hawkbit was to work with um, RTOS, by the way. So yes, you can do. Uh, the DDI, uh, so you can use the, the MQTT uh, API or the DDI API, and literally can just run it on a, on a controller uh, as well, like uh, you're using any other operating system. So it's like straightforward. And there is, I guess, also a demo by um, Newit, Newit is an operating system for uh, microcontrollers, and minute, they do uh, they Apache did, Minute. Yes. Yep. And they did develop like a client based on the DDI API that actually um, up, uh, update the software running on LED, small LED. So you have a, a certain uh, MCU that is controlling 200 uh, LEDs, and the software is updated or OTA for the for them. So yes. Even I learned something. That, oh, that, no, that, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Nicola. And I'm sorry we had to wrap things up quickly.